Cool. Right, well, welcome. And what we're going to do is start with Regan tonight, who is going to, first of all, run us through some of the history of this wonderful property. Um, so I think we'll kick straight into um, your presentation, Regan. Cool, thanks, Liz. Right, well, um, what are we looking at tonight? Well, we're looking at a very special wine, um, Chateau Le Michon, uh, Aubryon, and a wine that unusually, I don't recall us ever actually opening a bottle for a tasting at Glengarry during the kind of 12 years I've been there, which is funny because it's one of the most highly respected wines in Bordeaux um, and in the world. I think the reason we haven't is it tends to fall into a little bit of a gray area. And that gray area is somewhere between second growth and first growth. Um, it's significantly more expensive than the second growths, often up to double the price of the second growths. Um, and it's not quite as expensive as the first growths. Um, so it tends to get overlooked by people who are buying the first growths because you know they just step up to that price. And then it tends to be too expensive for the people who regularly drink the seconds, such as your Le Villescasse or your, your Pichon Lalande, that kind of territory. Um, so it's going to be an interesting tasting tonight um, to look at these wines all together because I've certainly never done a vertical of Le Mission Aubryon. And it's a pretty exciting vertical as well. I was trying to put this together with the vintages that we had. Um, and so you'll see we don't have it laid out tonight in a direct vertical. Um, we've got it laid out in two flights of three. One with the you know, so-called weaker vintages, which is the first flight we're going to do, the 2007, 2008, and 2011. Certainly the cheaper vintages, if you look at your price sheet. Um, and I think the main reason I wanted to do that was to look at those in context together um, so that we could look at that second flight side by side, um, which is a pretty incredible flight of wines. Um, the Michelin Aubryon 2009, 2010, and 2015. Um, and it's no um, uh, exaggeration to say that those are three of the greatest vintages um, ever made in the history of the estate. And they certainly would agree with that as well. So I certainly wanted to try all three of those side by side um, and just to see really how they stood up against each other. Um, so it's going to be pretty exciting. So I guess um, what we'll look at first of all is, is whereabouts we actually are in Bordeaux. So I'm just going to share this here and you guys should be able to see that come up on your screen. Uh, and that's the pretty iconic label um, of Le Mission Aubryon. And now you should be seeing a map of Bordeaux. Um, so when people say, what Bordeaux are you tasting tonight? And my partner certainly asked that earlier. She said, is it left bank or right bank? Um, and my answer was neither, um, because we're really looking at a wine here that comes from the heart of Bordeaux. So you can see the left bank um, coming down the left side of the Gironde there um, from the Medoc, you know, down through um, Pauillac and St. Julien and Margot. And the right bank's clear over there with our Libon, Pomerol, saint Emilion. Um, but where we are here is Pessac Lyon um, or Grave. And we're right in the heart, literally, of Bordeaux City. So where you can see Bordeaux City right down there, right in the center. Um, we're literally within um, the city itself here. Um, you can see on there it has Graves uh, listed as number three further down, um, but Le Mission Aubryon is right up here in the heart of Bordeaux. So we'll come into this next picture and you'll really get an idea of what we're looking at. There's a satellite view. You can see Graves, you can see Buzz turn uh, further on down there. Uh, and you can see Pessac. Um, and Aubryon, uh, Le Mission, is directly across the road, and this is right in the heart of the city here. Um, of course, at one stage, this was far out of the city, uh, and now the city is built up to completely surround these vineyards themselves here. Mm. If we look a little bit closer on the map, that's an even better look there. So you can see the outskirts of, of Bordeaux City, and Chateau Aubryon and Le Mission Aubryon are right in here, right in the heart of Bordeaux. So the city has really expanded all the way out here and so where the the vineyards kind of proper start and the city stops is really like quite far out now whereas this used to be a long way from the city um, certainly in the days of, of horse travel um, but Le Mission and Aubryon um, they sit right in the heart there and they sit on a, a gravel mound that's really about 25 meters above sea level um, they certainly would have overlooked the surrounding plateau and looked down on the surrounding landscape and now you've got the situation where you've got kind of flats and 
office blocks uh, and towers that are now looking down on, on these vineyards. Um, so it's almost been reversed over the years. Uh, I just wondering, is, was a lot of, as they did that building out, were there a lot of vineyards lost to the, to the town or, or if you like, were, were the good ones kept? Um, most of the good ones were all kept um, throughout that period, though I think a lot of the lesser vineyards did tend to disappear um, over the centuries. It's only the very, very famous ones that have remained um, because of that, you know, that, that encroaching in city is always a, a big issue. Um, now, if we're looking at the kind of time period for Aubryon and Lemission, um, these are very, very old estates. I mean, the two of them have been connected since about um, 1540. Um, a man called uh, Jean de Pontac, uh, he purchased uh, Chateau Aubryon in 1533. And in 1533, when he brought it really over the next 20 years, he brought up all the neighboring vineyards around there, constructed the Chateau for Aubryon in 1549. Um, it had been known since the 14th century, um, not necessarily for wine growing, but certainly as a, a designated piece of land. Um, so Le Mission is a little bit younger um, than Aubryon. Um, in 1540, there was a Bordeaux merchant, his name was uh, Arno de Lestonac, and he purchased a plot basically um, across the road from Aubryon. Um, at that stage, it was known as Aregahus, um, and he also, the same year, he married a woman called Marie de Pontac. She was the only sister of Jean de Pontac, um, and he was the owner of, of Aubryon um, at the time, and he was aware of the tremendous potential of the land um, that he had bought thanks to his relationships um, with the Pontax. Uh, and he worked very, very hard, um, again, building up um, plant by plant, plot by plot, to create this estate of Le Mission that was dedicated entirely to, to wine growing. Now, he died in 1548, uh, and his son Pierre took over the business. Um, 1572, he became a kind of a judge in Bordeaux, began some more building work on the property, um, built a house, built a cellar. Uh, his daughter Olive was born then. Um, and Olive de Lestinac, she dedicated her life and her fortune to various kind of religious actions, um, uh, philanthropic activities, um, three times married, three times widowed, no children. Um, so she really focused on her charity work. Uh, and I think one of the charities um, uh, her aunt started, the Sisters of the Company of Mary Our Lady, she started that in 1607. And that still exists today. Um, so, but because she had no children, uh, when she died at the age of 80, um, her will mentions 200,000 pounds that were donated to a number of religious causes, uh, which was just a colossal sum at the time. Uh, and that paled in comparison to what she'd given away during her lifetime as well. Uh, and so basically there was a few twists and turns and there was an annuity uh, that led to the creation of um, Le Mission Aubryon. Uh, the legacy um, of her estate was given away in 1682 and translated, transferred uh, to the Lazaris of Bordeaux, known as the Priests of the Mission. Uh, and so the ownership of the land um, came under the Catholic Church. And on their arrival, these priests began to really develop the land and work the vineyard in earnest. Um, they transformed all the kind of remaining plots that were sitting there, um, improving the cultivation of the, the vines, um, the quality. Um, of the wine as well. And they built this chapel, this little church that you can see there in the picture. Uh, it was called the Chapel de Notre Dame de Aubryon uh, in 1698. Uh, and it became known as the Chapel of Our Lady of the Mission. Uh, and that was when it was blessed and concentrated um, for the Brotherhood. And then they built the chateau itself um, in 1713. And that chapel, uh, the La Mission itself, is still there to this day. And there's a photo of it. It looks very much the same as when it was constructed. Um, you can see the chateau on the right there. Um, that is the original church um, still on the left. Um, so it's pretty incredible how it sits there now. Now the mission congregation at the time um, was listed, I think the last when it was drawn up in 1729 on the 13th of February. Uh, there was eight priests four brothers and five servants. And at the time, the estate was uh, producing around about 24 barrels of wine, um, a vintage, you know, so it wasn't particularly big. I think they had about 15 hectares of vines that weren't particularly um, closely planted. Um, and you can see them, uh, them here. They certainly like to enjoy um, a little bit of their own product. Um, 
I'm pretty sure that the barrels wouldn't have been marked like that back in 1757. I think there's a bit of artistic license in that picture there, um, probably done a little bit later on. Uh, now, certainly in round about this time, around about 1757, um, there was a Marshal, uh, Louis Armand, um, who was the Duke of Richelieu. He was appointed governor um, of the province. And um, like most French nobles, he was a Burgundy drinker, um, not a Bordeaux drinker. Bordeaux was really considered an English wine um, during this kind of time period. And he slowly began to discover um, the wines of Bordeaux because he'd been spending more time in the province. And one day he tried a wine that he considered to be particularly remarkable when he tasted it. And he asked his servant um, where it came from. Uh, and his servant said, uh, Le Mission Aubryon. Uh, and it, um, the marshal cried out, if God had forbade drinking, would he have made wine so good? <laughs> and I think that was certainly the, the motto of the monks at the time here when they were making this wine as well. And from that day onwards, that new governor um, served only Le Mission Aubryon um, at his table for all of his, his regular guests. Um, now the successor kind of to him um, was uh, one of the Dukes, um, managing director um, of uh, Domaine Clarence Dillon, um, actually was related to one of these Dukes um, who came in during this time period here. Um, he was a man of sophisticated and austere tastes. Uh, he always served Le Mission Aubryon at his table, but um, with a bit more moderation. And he was dealing a lot with the court of the, the King of France. Uh, this was Louis the 16th at the time. Uh, and he continued to offer um, Le Mission to Louis as well at that time. Now, this is a time period, if you can imagine, so Chateau Puff Clement, for example, um, that was being drunk only at the time by the popes and the high members of the church. Um, so this particular region of Bordeaux um, has always been controlled by the church, uh, by noblemen. It's been full of castles. It's a very feudal um, kind of region. Um, it's not very much a, an old school kind of farming region. This was a very, very wealthy region of Bordeaux. Um, and so Puff Clement was only being drunk by the church, but Le Mission Aubryon was being traded regularly on the Bordeaux market at this time. And it was selling for a price that was higher than anything but the first growths. Now, of course, 1790, um, the revolution um, hit Bordeaux hard uh, and being owned by the church, uh, the entire estate was confiscated um, by, the, uh, by the French government. Um, and following the revolution, uh, they had to give over all their property um, and the mission itself was then sold on as a national asset to a Bordeaux businessman. Um, he brought it for £302,000 um, at the time, um, around about 1794, they think. That was the main house, the production buildings, and they had about 25 hectares of vineyards at the time. Now, they had initially estimated the cost at 100000 and it sold for three times that price. So that was really a testament to the hard work that the, that the monks had really, had really put in. Um, now... Uh, his daughter, after he died in 1821, didn't really care at all for the property, and she sold it to the first American family who took it over. Uh, it was uh, a woman called Celestine uh, Schiapella, uh, and she fell under the charms of the property. She was born in New Orleans um, in Louisiana, uh, and in 1774, she was, um, sorry, he was the adopted son uh, of a very rich merchant, purchased the property with the aim of retiring to Bordeaux, uh, and he'd already managed several estates there, including uh, Cos d'Estanel. Uh, and they continued to improve the property, him and his son. Uh, they built that wall that you can see there in front. They enclosed the property uh, itself. Uh, and they also built that superb wrought iron gate uh, that you can see there in that picture. That still stands to the, this day um, after they bought it. Uh, now, thanks to the links with Louisiana, uh, he developed a lot of trade between Bordeaux uh, and New Orleans at the same time as kind of improving the quality of the wine um, and the vineyard itself. And so Le Mission was being drunk um, a lot, uh, particularly in the southern states of the United States, one of the first kind of top Bordeaux to be drunk around that kind of region. Um, the modern era really started about kind of 1919. Uh, it was sold on again. Um, and at the time it was sold in 1919, it had a, a wonderful reputation. Uh, sorry, in 1884, it was sold on, had a wonderful reputation um, across all of Europe, um, Great Britain and the United States. Um, but of course, it failed to make 
1855 classification. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for this. Firstly, that almost no estates outside of the Medoc were classified in 1855. In fact, the only one was Chateau Aubryon itself. Everything else um, came from the Medoc, and certainly all of the first growths um, came from the Medoc, except for, for Aubryon. And this is despite the fact that Le Mission uh, was selling for a higher price than all of the second growths um, during this time period. Um, so it was totally overlooked. Um, now, um, the modern era, purchased in 1919 uh, by Frederick Waltner, uh, another Bordeaux merchant. Uh, and there've been a lot of changes over the past kind of 25, 30 years, uh, but it was still um, incredibly highly thought after. Um, now, uh, they were still using 19th century technology as were most of the kind of the top um, estates in Bordeaux at the time. And so he really brought it along with the help of his sons into the, the modern era. Uh, first to install kind of stainless steel vats uh, with interior coating. Um, and they were one of the first estates, certainly in the Graves, to do that. Um, and that meant that they could keep their temperatures during fermentation down to 20 to kind of 28 degrees rather than the 30 plus, which was quite common at the time there. So they actually called it um, cold fermentation. Um, cold meaning it was lower than 30. Um, so a little bit unusual. He was the first to produce the white um, at Aubryon. They significantly changed the interior, exterior of the property, um, put in all of those wrought iron arcades um, built in Spain, did a lot of work restoring the original chapel uh, at the time, um, inscribed the most prestigious vintages um, of La Mission Aubryon and gold lettering um, on the roof of the chapel was a, uh, an innovation of his. Uh, and uh, when he died in 1933, um, passed it on to his children uh, and Henri, um, having worked with his father for a very long time, was the natural uh, to continue on. Uh, and of course, it was taken over by the Germans um, during the Second World War. They were forced to house German officers uh, within the house. Um, but luckily, the kind of dignity of the, uh, the family uh, at the time, while they were working there, meant that the German officers had such respect for the Waltner family that they actually never plundered um, the sellers of Le Mission Aubryon. Um, you know, they, the family shared some vintages with the Germans, but the Germans never took liberties and actually stripped it, unlike many of the other chateaux um, that they were housed in. So they were very, very lucky. Um, they regained possession, of course, in 1945, um, and it was one of the great vintages um, for Le Mission Aubryon. Now, uh, Henri Waltner, he died in 1974. He produced 50 vintages at Le Mission Aubryon. Uh, and um, one of the husband of one of his nieces continued after that point, um, a guy called Francis Devavan. He managed the business successfully for several years during the 1970s, early 1980s. And this is during that period where international air travel was really starting to take off. Uh, and he was one of the first to regularly be flying to the United States, uh, to be flying to Great Britain, uh, really spreading the word of La Mission Aubryon. And one of the things that he instituted at the time was a very strict price regime. He was the one who said that Le Mission must sell for 75% of the price of the first growths. So he was the first to kind of put that into, into writing at the time. Uh, now, eventually, of course, uh, um, there was disputes over money within the family, as there often is, uh, and it was finally put up for sale um, again in 1983. Uh, and brought by the current owners then, uh, which is the Dillon family, um, Domain Clarence Dillon. Um, and their offer was accepted the 2nd of November for 95 million French francs at the time. And the thing that was special about the Dillon family is that they were the owners of Chateau Aubryon, directly across the road. So the two chateaux had competed uh, for centuries as to who was going to be the greatest. And then finally they had come together um, under the same ownership. Um, so it's a very, very interesting relationship. So they've now been together under the same family for 37 years. Um, and so things have, have changed a lot there. Liz is going to talk later on about the kind of that more modern period since the Dillon family took it over. But um, of course, the famous story about the Dillon family buying Aubryon was that he was looking for a, an estate to buy. Um, there was a lot of top estates up for sale in Bordeaux at the time. I think Chateau Margot was up for sale, Petrus was up for sale, Aubryon was up for sale. Uh, and he went off with his driver from Bordeaux City um, to look at all of these vineyards and a huge fog rolled in 
the driver got completely lost. They ended up just driving around in circles uh, within the city. And eventually they stopped on the side of the road to try and get their bearings. And they realized they were stopped directly outside of Aubryon. Uh, and the story was that Clarence Dillon didn't even get out of his limousine. He was so sick of driving around that he said on the spot that he was going to buy the chateau. Uh, and so that's how it came into the ownership originally of the, of the Dillon family. Uh, and then now, of course, since 1983, um, they have Chateau uh, Le Mission au Brion as well. So it's a, it's a pretty cool story behind the establishment of this estate. Mm. All right. Anybody else thirsty? I'm thirsty after that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say thank you, Regan. Excellent uh, introduction. Always great to get the history behind the estate before we start looking at it. And I think, yeah, it is time to try some wine. Um, I won't keep you too long before trying them, but I thought just useful before we start. Um, Regan mentioned before we're doing it in two different flights, and I don't know what I've I've done to upset Regan recently, but um, he's given me the less of vintages. Quietly though, and it's unfortunate that he's listening. Um, I'd much rather talk about these than talk about the great vintages. So perhaps you knew what you were doing there, Regan. Um, and why is I also had a heads up, uh, Liz from Zane, who uh, who <laughs> tested them all and bottled them for us. That um, his two favourite wines from the entire flight uh, were both in this vintage uh, in this flight. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think we are going to see that for sure. Um, and I think, you know, why are lesser vintages sometimes some of the greatest Bordeaux? I think when you get a lesser vintage, there's a whole heap of different characters to think about. You know, one is you're not looking at necessarily pristine fruit. You know, it's not a great vintage. Something's gone wrong in the weather conditions, usually. Um, so you do get the producers, they really try hard to make the best they can. But also, I think you often find that lesser vintages express a sense of place, or as French put it, a sense of terroir, stronger than great vintages. Great vintages, you often are talking more about the purity of the fruit and, you know, the, the intensity of the wine and sitting there thinking, gosh, I wish I had 50 or 60 years to wait to see this in its maturity. Whereas with a lesser vintage, not only are you going to see more of a representation, I think, sometimes than of the place it's grown, you're also going to be able to appreciate that earlier because generally lesser vintages do mature a lot earlier than the great vintages. So before we jump into the first one, the other thing I had for you was um, Le Mission Hortbrion, if I had to sum it up in terms of stylistically, what does this chateau produce? What are the wines like? They tend to have always an intensity to them. There's a richness and an opulence, but they have charm. They're, they're really full-bodied. They're immensely concentrated. They are definitely bigger in structure than Aubryon, although they're just across the road. They're definitely bigger in structure, but they also, they require time. Now, Regan touched on one of the reasons that they are more full-bodied and more concentrated is that cool fermentation that they use. And it does allow greater um, extraction because um, it's a little bit cooler, but I'll come to that because I'll talk a bit more about the actual winemaking, but we need to taste something. So the, the first one we are going to look at then is the 2007. And why don't we first of all, just grab a glass if you haven't already and let's have a look at it. Because I know I've been sitting here patiently going, let's just wait, but let's have a look at it. Mm. That's super interesting because, you know, a lot of 2007s, you know, no matter where they sit on the quality spectrum, are showing quite distinct age character now and are looking a lot older than that does. I do get a little bit of sort of that forest fl floor and perhaps the secondary characters that um, Cabernet and Merlot get as they age on that. But certainly, um, you know, it'd be a kind of wine that I'd hate to get blind to be trying to work out what the age of it was because that's looking a lot fresher than 2007 um, should be. And one of the reasons for that is this was considered widely as the top wine from 2007. And the 
the vintage in terms of the conditions, um, it had a very mild and humid um, winter and spring. Um, there was a huge risk due to the humidity. And actually because of that, what they did at La Mission is they went through on the east side of the rows and removed leaves. So went through, manually removed the leaves to expose the fruit, um, to dry it out, to try and ensure that they didn't end up with rot all the way through um, their grapes. And then as it went on, they actually removed the, the leaves on the other side as well to give it more exposure to try and get it ripe. They then used an impressive 200 people to sort these grapes when they came in. So really humid, they tried to avoid rot. 200 people, they will have had rot there, um, but they've, they've sorted it to get only the best berries. Now, because of that, very low production um, vintage. Um, but I think you can see in the glass that we've got something that's quite extraordinary because they've done that selection. Now, the vintage itself, in terms of gem generalizations, what, what is 2007 like? It's a vintage that char is characterized by being low in everything. So low in tannin, low in ripeness, low in alcohol, low in acidity, low in flavor. But when you look at the vintage, although that's a generalization of it, and you know, let's face it, if, <laughs> if you read that, you'd also probably not buy any 2007s. There were some producers and a very, very few in this vintage that made very, very good wine. And this is one of them. And why, why were some better than the others or why did some make good wine? That selection of berries was really important, but also when they chose to pick. And these guys did leave the grapes out there and it did, um, dry, they did dry out and they did manage to get ripe. And particularly with Cabernet, Cabernet likes a really good long hang time. And uh, this definitely got that. It's 48% Cabernet, 43% Merlot, and 9% Cabernet Franc. And I think it sits just under about 13% alcohol. It's 12 point something. Um, so relatively low sort of in terms of what we were seeing around the year 2005. They were higher than that, and certainly 9 and 10 were. Um, but yeah, it, it was a year characterized by being low in everything. But I don't know about you, when, it, when I look at that tonight, that's definitely not low in anything. It's, it's exceptionally good. That's very drinkable uh, right now as well, <laughs> which I yeah. think is, is interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing about the sevens is that they've been pretty drinkable right from the start. And I think mm. even looking at, at this wine, Liz, which was one of the wines of the vintage, most people even early on said that this was probably a wine that was going to be fully mature by 20. Um, and you can see that, that that's probably the direction it's heading in. Um, it's definitely mm. a vintage that there's no need to wait much longer than that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the great thing with these lesser vintages, isn't it? Yeah, I think the other interesting thing uh, with this, as you can see, I think Neil Martin's comment here that he, that he thought that um, uh, it was perhaps even outclassing the, uh, the gaff across the road. Bit of, um, bit of uh, English slang there, but yeah. I think that's something that Obreon is, uh, La Mission Obreon has traditionally been known for, um, certainly is overperforming in lesser vintages. Uh, and I think most people would agree that certainly over the last 50 or so years, um, the worse the vintage, the more likely it is that La Mission Obreon um, outperforms Obreon itself. Um, whereas perhaps in the great years, um, the Tawar of Obreon uh, performs a little bit better and it manages to, to just um, pip out La Mission. Um, so generally in great years, they're both fantastic, but Obreon might be a little bit better. Um, but certainly when it's not a good vintage, um, the Tawar at La Mission Obreon seems to really excel uh, and produce some great wines. Yeah, definitely. Just back to that, um, sort of before we go on to the next one, just on the fermentation temperature. So Regan mentioned that you know, two significant things at La Mission is in the 1920s, they put these glass lined metal tanks in for their fermentation. And they were actually the first in the region to do that. And a couple of things that did come out of that is obviously the hygiene of having uh, glass lined metal tanks that made their wines a lot cleaner than anywhere else. Um, but also it gave them the ability to cool the fermentation. And 
when you ferment at a lower temperature, there's a number of things that you achieve. You do reduce the risk of volatile acidity in your wine. So um, that, that's, that's a good thing. Um, some wines, you know, are characteristic of having some, but it does reduce the risk of that. You also um, enable the aromatic profile to be more lifted. And I think you see that in these wines as, you know, they are quite charming and quite aromatic. It also, they found, gave them the ability to leave the wines with um, the de uh, yeast cells of Elise for longer. And it also has given them the ability to extract more colour uh, and, in general, more extract. So it gives a, you know, when I was talking before about that full bodied, um, the bold colour, the intensity that you get in these wines, that is coming a lot from that. In terms of their actual winemaking, they do sort in the field. Um, so they'll sort coming off um, the vines. They then do de-stem everything. Um, and they are, interestingly, Regan and I were just chatting about it before, they are blending uh, before they put it into wood, which is reasonably uh, unusual. Normally parcels are kept separate and then it's blended af um, afterwards. And they used to use about, well, 100% new oak. They've toned that back dramatically. And I think as we see moving through these, we should get to a stage where we're looking at wines that probably have about 35% new. Um, so much less sort of use of that new oak there for sure. So that's 2007. I think that's a, a rather exceptional place to start. Um, Heather, um, what's the um, grape percentages in the first one? Because it hasn't got it on the... Yep, so 48% Cabernet, 43% Merlot, and 9% Cabernet Franc for the 2007. So the next two vintages, um, 2008 and 2011, vintages I really like um, for very, very different reasons. I think 2008 was a, a hugely overlooked vintage. Uh, and it was one that I think really represented a lot of value from top to bottom because it just was really gorgeous, really early drinking. Um, and, you know, again, a, a vintage where Cabernet, if it was left out on the vine, uh, did get nice and ripe and you got some lovely purity. So this vintage, um, rainy, very cool spring unfortunately hail so this is one um very very small vintage they lost a lot uh in terms of their yields due to hail it was in a very late fruit set um it was a challenged fruit set as well so you had always these issues and then it was cold it was damp and they were very late to start picking in bordeaux in general in 2008 um if you had a vineyard that had really good exposition, so the, the soil was really good, then you did actually get a lovely 2008. So it just depended where you were. Um, across the region, average hang time was as long as 100 days um, and actually up to 160. So really extended growing period for Cabernet here. So this 2008 is 51% um, Cabernet. So we see more Cabernet um, than the 2007. 43% uh, Merlot, so exactly the same amount of Merlot and just 6% Cabernet Franc. So if you haven't already, let's have a little look at that one. Wow, you see that's, that's characteristically what 2008 is to me on the nose is they have this lovely plushness to them, the 08s. And you know, it might be a cooler vintage, but it's just dominated by purity of red fruit. Mm. Yeah, the fruit, fruit's always really pure in those eights and it's always really fresh as well. It's got like mm -hmm. really nice focus, awesome acidity. It has, yeah, the freshness is always there really lifted as well. I really like the eights and the, and the fruit style, even though it's kind of plush, it's, it's cool at the same time. It's not, it's not heavy. No, exactly. And I think if you compare that to the previous one where you might recall, I said, you know, 2007 is characterized by being low in everything, you know, low in tannin, low in acid, low in alcohol, 
you know, low in flavor, extract, everything. This too, and I mean, that seven was a beautiful wine to start on, but this one by comparison, you know, you the tannins are there and gosh, they're beautifully ripe and rich to them. And that goes to, you know, when I was talking before about the style of Lemission, I think we're seeing it really well in this glass. You know, I talked about intensity, richness, opulence, and concentration, and this wine's got all of that. Um, so what the seven didn't have, you know, the eight definitely does have. Um, and although, you know, it's showing us all those wonderful characters, it's not going to have the concentration of what's going to happen in the second flight. Um, but shows you, again, you know, a vintage that's not highly rated, cool vintage, early drinking, that's still got a lot of time ahead of it. It's just, yeah, it's very, very useful tonight. In fact, I'm, I'm again, I'm very surprised with how useful it is, but it goes to that statement about the longevity of Lemission. And I think that's one of the challenges, you know, Regan, you were talking about the fact that Lemission, we don't often open it. I think also, you know, it's, it's not a wine that, we sell as much of as the other um, chateau that we import because I think it gets lost. Um, and you know, Jensis describes it as being the insider's wine because it is so good, but no one knows it's so good because it just it gets missed in everything that happens, uh, which is just such a shame because these these are very useful and have got a lot of time ahead of them. Yeah, I think it traditionally also. Um, tended to be a wine that certainly 20 plus years ago was extremely sturdy uh, in its youth uh, mm. and perhaps unapproachable, um, certainly compared to the, the elegance and refinement of, um, of Aubryon across the road. Um, Le Mission was always more muscular, it was more tannic, it was deeper, it was oh, darker. Yeah. You know, it, it, it never really looked, you know, just quite as good young as that did. But I mean, this eight is looking beautiful. I love the focus in it as well. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I've got a note here from um, from Neil Martin because I think we've got a we've got a note there from when he tasted it in about 2012. His latest note in 2018, he's upped it to 96 plus, um, saying an extremely convincing showing at the moment. Um, much more pleasurable than the 08 Aubryon. Um, super fresh and complex. One of the best 08s out there. <laughs> yeah, it, it's amazing. Yeah, they're. I mean, they're already just two wines in. Um, showing their pedigree, and um, yeah, I I like these vintages, but gosh, it's going to be interesting to see them in the next lot of vintages. So just before we go to the next one, so to the eleven, um, in terms of the actual um, vineyard itself and the uh, viticulture there, um, so it's thirty point seven hectares. So we're not talking a large property. Um, 27 hectares of that is red, and um, actually I think Regan's got some great pictures here of it. We'll just jump to that um, while we're having a look at it. Um, yeah, so 3.7 hectares is white, and the white was actually, in terms of Le Mission Aubryon's history, was actually added um, a little bit later. It wasn't something um, that they had right from the beginning. Total production's only six and a half thousand cases. So again, that's probably why it's not sort of, I guess, as widely known as the, that production for the entire world is tiny. Um, you can see the vineyard there. It's actually quite deep gravel um, with clay and sand and a bit of chalk through it. The average vine age you're looking at is 27 years across the property. And the vineyard itself, the density is actually at 10,000 vines per hectare. Now that's different to Aubryon. Aubryon um, across the road, I think they're only about sort of somewhere between five to six, maybe a little bit closer to seven in some instances. Um, but Le Mission, um, they went through and have, have replanted some places and they're working to increase the density. They're on a north-south um, axis uh, through the vineyard. And the vineyard's actually planted at about, well, not about, at very exactly, 45.8% Cabernet, 43.8% Merlot, and 10.4% Cabernet Franc. And then, obviously, you've got the white as well. Um, so that's in terms of the actual vineyard makeup. I've got some lovely pictures of it there. You can see 
um, looking at the soil there, that lovely dip gravel and the pebbles sitting on the top there um, and some clay underneath that as well. Um, so perfect conditions for growing uh, Cabernet and also Merlot. So both the combination of the gravel and the clay, very, very important there. Very nice looking berries there. Don't think that's from the 2007 Vintage Dragon. I don't think so, no. <laughs> no, don't think we photograph vintages like seven. Yeah, I've got so, an interesting, um, interesting comment here from, um, from Jean-Philippe there who said that the, that the identities of the two properties um, really are so different, but because they, I found this really interesting, he said because they own both properties, they own Le Mission and they own Aubryon, he said um, legally if they wanted to, they could put all of Le Mission's output um, in with Aubryon and produce it all as, as first growth, all as premier Grand Cru class. Mm -hmm. um, there's no problem with them doing that um, legally, he said, but um, uh, the fusion of the two is, is unimaginable because the style of them is, is so different because of the vineyard plots. Um, he said that they've actually done some tests where they've blended together fruit um, from both the, um, the Le Mission sections of the vineyard and the Aubryon section of the vineyard, and it just doesn't work. The result is neither Aubryon um, nor Le Mission. It's um, a, another wine altogether with a completely different taste profile um, from those two wines. Um, so they actually have looked at and experimented with that kind of stuff in the past, um, but they've said, look, no, they really have their own identities. It's not winemaking. It is absolutely the Toa. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Characteristically very different. So Jean-Philippe, who Regan mentioned there, is the winemaker. And he's actually been the winemaker there since 2003. And uh, the winemaker um, before him was his father. Um, so very much a family affair here. And um, his father was the technical director for Hawkbrion for 40 years. And, you know, whenever you read anything about their winemaking and their approach to it, is it's very dedicated to precision, both in the vineyards and in the winery. And I think certainly what we're seeing in the glass. So if we go to 2011, and I mentioned before, this is a vintage I really like. The 11s, um, I remember tasting them on Premier. And after, you know, the year before was obviously 2010. And 2010 was just sort of, oh, I don't know how you'd explain it. And exercise and perseverance or something, you know, you'd sort of get to the end of the day and that much tannin and that much acidity and they were so big. And you just, you'd get to the end of the day and think, oh, do I need to go out for dinner? So I don't know that I actually want to go near a glass of wine. They were, it was just so intense. Then you went to taste the 11s and 11 was just so pretty when it was young. They were just, even as on premier, um, so barrel samples, they were so delicious. And it was a, a vintage that I really fell in love with for the drinkability of it. So in terms of um, what caused those conditions, um, they had a very, very uh, dry uh, spring. April, May and June were some of the driest since 1949. Uh, summer was then wet and then September was dry. So again, you know, sitting with the seven, eight and nine, all I've talked about is uh, wet and damp things and things that sort of haven't been ideal. This one's a little bit different because it's the dryness um, followed by the wet um, that characterized it. It was a very early harvest. It competed actually with 1893 as being one of the earliest, very, very low yields. And in fact, a lot of Grand Van was uh, declassified in this year. So one of the highest percentages or across the region of declassification. Um, it, despite all of that, it actually was rated higher than seven and some people rate it higher than eight as well. It was really at the end of the day considered quite a good vintage, just not great. Generally, the 11s, uh, they were fresh, they were bright, they're aromatic, lovely acidity, quite a bit more acidity than in fact we saw in 2009, and overall just delicious. So this line does have um, a lot more Cabernet to it, so 55% Cabernet, and it's actually got more Cabernet Franc as well, so it's 11% Cabernet Franc and then only 34% Merlot. 
It's a much more Cabernet dominant wine here. So I've had a little taste of this one. Mm. I think you can see what I mean by the vintage just being delicious. It's Moorish. You know, you taste Moorish it. Oh, you're muted, Regan. Yeah, Moorish is a good description. Yeah, it's it's chewy. But, mm. You know, there's plenty of tannin there, and the tannins are reasonably grainy, but delicious fruit to it. Wow. Mm. It's much better than I expected, actually, from an 11. Yeah, and that's the, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Frankie, yum, agree. Yum. Yeah, 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 it is. But that's, you know, you think even sitting in your mouth now, right? You had all those sort of chewy, moorish tannins. And then there's this gorgeous, bright, fresh fruit. And it just leaves you wanting to go back and have another sip. And these, this vintage has been like this since the beginning, is it's just been one that you've picked it up, you've gone, that's just yum, and you have another sip of it. It's just incredibly um, inviting wines which, yeah, I think it's really, really cool. And how different have those three wines been? Mm. You know, um, and that, that again, I don't think, um, and I haven't looked at the next three wines, but when you get great vintages, you don't see as much variation as I think we've just seen in these three. I, it's going to be very interesting, but I think just the difference in the wines I would expect in these three will be more stark than it is in the next ones. So before we go on to the great vintages and Regan talks about all the lovely things at the end, um, we'll just go to the next um, part of the history. So Regan talked about uh, the historical side of the Chateau and up to when the Dillon family purchased it in 1983. And actually, um, I think Regan's got some pictures there as well, which we might bring up. Um, so actually really interesting. So in 83, um, you know, it was put up for sale and uh, widely touted that it would be the Dillon family that would end up purchasing it. But uh, for the signing to happen and the final um, sort of stage of that, uh, Joan Dillon, who, she was a duchess, she actually asked to have her, at the time, 15-year-old son pulled out of the English uh, boarding school that he was in and wanted him there to witness the purchase of it. Now, her son uh, was Prince Robert of Luxembourg, and this is uh, Prince Robert um, pictured there. So he was excused from classes so that he could go to Bordeaux and that he could oversee this. And Joan Dillon um, was married to Prince Charles of the Royal Family of Luxembourg. So that's where the connection came in. And it's, it's lovely that he was there at that early stage when they took it over because he now is the president of the estate and continues to manage it today, which is great. And as we saw before, He's very much assisted by an excellent um, winemaking team headed up by Jean-Philippe uh, Damas. And that's Jean-Philippe in the centre there and with his technical director and viticulturalist on either side of him. So the Dillon family, as Regan said, were oh, are owners of Hauteriand. So very nice for them to then have both. When they um, purchased it, so 18, sorry, 1983, they then set about to do a whole lot of change. They renovated, they replanted parts of the vineyard. They actually increased the amount of Merlot um, planted. So if you, you go back to very old uh, Le Mission Aubryon, there's less Merlot than there is there now. So they increased... Uh, sorry, there's, yeah, there's less Merlot. They increased the Merlot and decreased the Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. Um, they also um, put a new vat hall in, in 87 and a new bottling line in, in 1996. So they've not been standing still at all. 2007, they then went through and rejuvenated the entire cellars and the bottling and storage area. 
and actually did that uh, to look very much like a monastery. So Regan talked at the beginning about the sort of religious uh, undertones here at the chateau, and that's continued through in how they've restored it today. The new Grand Chais is actually made from stone that's come from a quarry uh, in the Bordeaux region, and it's actually referred to I think we might have some pictures of some of these uh, buildings, but it's actually referred to as the modern cathedral to wine. Um, just absolutely gorgeous, this property. It was then in um, 2017 um, that things changed a little bit for La Mission in terms of where they stood in the wine world. I mean, as I mentioned before, Gensis has always said, you know, this is the ultimate insider's wine. You needed to know it was good to know that it was good. Um, but LiveX, uh, the um, sort of standard, I guess, for tracking the value of wines and particularly the secondary market, they bring out a, a rating of uh, the top 100 power brands in the world. And they actually rated uh, Le Mission Aubryon in 2017 as the 14th most powerful brand in the world. And they stated at the time that if they did the 1855 classification again, that this property would well and truly be at the level of the first growths. Um, over the years, um, you know, I mean, it's it's debatable whether you follow critics too closely, because I think, you know, sometimes if you do, you would certainly miss out on drinking wines like um, we've just had in this lesser flight, because these are wines that critics would have definitely um, undervalued or um, underrated, but since 82, uh, Le Mission Aubryon has received um, 100 points um, from multiple people, but at least six vintages have been rated um, perfect scores. So it's certainly a, a property that's on the up, and I think we're going to see in sort of the next flight where it's heading. Should we go to the next flight, Regan? Yeah, I've got a note here from um, Parker as well. When he did his last vintage book, Liz, he said that in my own personal collection, I've got more bottles yeah. of La Mission Aubryon than any other wine in the world um, because it's mo one of the most consistent in terms of quality across all vintages. Um, so I think that's a pretty pretty uh, rounding endorsement from, uh, from Robert Parker. Hmm. Mm. Definitely. Right, Tom. Um, with that, um, that 2011 in, uh, in mind, guys, I've got a little, um, a little video here um, that I think you'll like. It's um, James Suckling, um, and it's, this is during the 2011 um, On Premier campaign, and he's tasting the 2011 um, Le Mission Aubryon, and he's tasting it with, um, with uh, Jean-Philippe and Prince Robert, and they're comparing the 2011 Le Mission Aubryon directly against the 2009 and 2010 that we're going to try and talking about the the quality of 2011 um, in the context, um, as well as the sheer quality of, uh, of nine and 10 as well. So I think you'll find this quite interesting. The video might lag a little bit when we're sharing on Zoom, um, but you should be able to hear fine. Just, um, just turn your volume up here. So I'll share this through. Yeah, we've decided to prioritize the audio over the visual. <laughs> Just finished an amazing tasting of Old Grand. We tasted La Mission Aubryon, the second wines. We tasted a new wine from Saint Simon, Quintus, which used to be Terre de Duguay. But we had 2011, 2010, and 2009. And really, you know, I've heard things that 11, disappointing. I'm really impressed. It's a beautiful wine. The problem is you're tasting. 2010 and 2009. If we forgot those two vintages, I think we'd be pretty excited about 11. But Robert, tell me what you think about 11 in comparison to those two vintages, to 9 and 10, the great vintages. We're excited about the birth of every new child. And the fact is that 2011 is a, is a great wine. Uh, it's just, uh, it happens to be in this case, next to 09 and 10, which are absolute behemoths as far as uh, the history of wine in Bordeaux over the last hundred years are concerned, both of them. I mean, you have to relativize. When we're talking about these vintages, we're talking about the likes of the 61s, the 59s, the 45s, the 89s, 
and uh, to put them side by side. So uh, here we have a concentration over the last 10 years of some of the best wines that have been produced in Bordeaux. And in 2011, uh, I think if you took them out of this context, context and you put them in the 60s, 70s, 80s decades, these wines would be some of the best that were produced, 50s in included. Uh, so uh, I'm very excited about the quality uh, within the context which no one else is tasting. So I was having as much fun as you tasting them next to the 2009. Uh, they do not pale by comparison. They are a wonderful concentrated uh, wines. Uh, and I think that it's just that we've been uh, so uh, except, exceptionally spoiled over the last 10 years in the kind of vintages that we produce here in Bordeaux and also that our winemakers have become particularly paranoid uh, and, uh, are, and as far as the selection is concerned, the work that's been done in the vineyard and, and, and I think that uh, the work that has been undertaken by my colleagues here in Bordeaux has, has been better, better than ever. Uh, but we, we, we also have the economic means to have been able to do that uh, and uh, the obsession to want to produce the best wine every year. Impressive. Um, Jean-Philippe, what, mm -hmm. uh, what about you as a winemaker when you taste your 11 against the 10 and the 9? What do you think? Did, are you like happy? Well, this is really good. I mean, even for you, you like us as people that love drinking Bordeaux. The 9 and 10 are so special, but then the 11 in the end, c'est pas mal, c'est... <laughs> For, for uh, nine and ten is, is more than pas mal, <laughs> um, for sure. But the, uh, it's always, it, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's more and more difficult to compare these young vintages with the uh, other vintages by the past because, uh, as you, you said before, we, we, we have done in the last few years so many improvements. In, in the vineyards and, and at the gate of the vat house and, uh, in, and then, as you said before, Monsieur, in the so many uh, selection in, in the, for the blend, so the, the wines from the, the 21st century, it, it, even if the weather condition is very close to some vintages by the past, the wine is not, in, is, is not the same. So the, uh, the 11, for example, is not an easy vintage because uh, the, uh, the spring was quite very dry, maybe, not maybe, the driest spring than ever. And, uh, and uh, the challenge was to select the, the perfectly uh, ripe berries. And uh, so we do a lot of work outside, we do a lot of work the gate, a special machine since uh, now, the optical sorting machine, and it, it, and it works uh, perfectly well in the 2011 vintage so it, it's it's another kind of wine it's, it's uh, the 11 uh, for the weather condition um, is maybe the 94 but with the modern techniques so it's, it's 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 not possible to compare with 94 and 11 11 is much better than 94 uh, with the same kind of I would say uh, um, pro matière première so we uh, and for 10 or, or, or 9, special vintage. And, and uh, for me, it's, it's maybe we can compare 09 and 10 with 89 and 90 because the, the 09 is so how perfect. About, how about 59 and 61? Ah, no, because, because the, uh, for me, the, 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 we, we have this kind of freshness in the 10 than we have in the uh, uh, 90 vintage. But okay. there's a ripeness for the 09 and 89. It's, it's not overripe, but it's kind of maybe exotic for, uh, for our estates. And, uh, and the, so for this kind of balance, we have a kind of ressemblance, if I may say, between 89 and again, uh, and 09 and 90 and, and 2010. 59 and 61 is close to the 89. Okay. But it, it, for, for me, there is no com comparison between 61 and, for example, 90. It's, it's, it is, uh, for me, it's 59, 61, 89, 2009. This is kind of the same style of wine. Okay. Well, the great thing is what I like about Bordeaux is so obviously we have two fabulous vintages, 2009 and 2010. Sure. You have an excellent year or very good year, 2011. I have to taste more. But what I love about Bordeaux is that intellectual opportunity to actually discuss and think about historically how it tastes. Sure. I think that's Bordeaux. And well, I think it's particularly interesting with these three vintages also. Mm. Uh, and the fact that 
2010. We don't usually taste the wines at this particular stage. Usually, the 2000, we taste it when it's off, you know, and we taste it when it's in the bottle. So you do. I don't. Uh, as much as so interesting to taste it in between. So the 2010 actually closed again. Is, uh, it will all change uh, uh, remarkably in the next uh, 12 months and, uh, when it's put, it's put in bottles. So um, it's a fascinating moment to be able to taste these uh, three back to back. Well, great tasting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. All right, some pretty um, interesting comments from those guys. There. You can see that they reference 2011 most closely to probably 1994, but just the, the, the technology that they have now, the money they have now to afford to be able to declassify fruit, to drop fruit on the ground is just so much better. Uh, and then the um, quality of the nine and the 10 um, that's coming through is just going to be fabulous. Um, so if you need a minute to just go to the bathroom and have a little bit of a rest just before we do this final flight, maybe take um, take two minutes if you need that and then we'll kick into these. Um, it's not really going to be a whole lot for me to say about these vintages, which is why I gave the difficult ones to Liz because these are three absolutely fantastic, perfect vintages um, where they really had very few problems um, in the vineyard. So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes, then we'll come back and we'll look at these. All right, guys, looks like we've, um, we've got everybody back. So this is a very, very special flight. Hopefully you've all got all three wines poured out. Glass one, 2009, Le Michon Aubryon. Glass two, 2010, and glass three, um, the 2015. Um, a pretty incredible flight of three wines here. I certainly can't recall um, even doing a first growth uh, tasting or a second growth tasting where we've had nine, 10, and 15 um, all sitting together in the glass. And um, as you heard Prince Philippe say there, um, that was obviously before the 2015 was made, but he said that 2009 and 2010 were two of the greatest vintages probably in the last 100 years in Bordeaux. And I would certainly put um, 2015 and now 2016 in that category as well. You can see how um, global warming has certainly been um, good for Bordeaux because those vintages are coming more and more often than we ever saw before in the past. Um, previously, we were really looking at, you know, 1982 and after 82, there was almost, um, um, you know, seven years until we had another great vintage, um, the, the pair of 89 and 90 together. Um, 95 and 96 were pretty good, but, but not really at that top flight level. Then we saw 2000, absolutely outstanding vintage, five-star vintage, and then 2005, another five-star vintage on, on both the left and the right bank. Um, and then we came to 2009 and 2010. It, it, it appears to be uh, a bit of a tradition in Bordeaux for these um, fabulous vintages um, to come in pairs. And a little bit like um, 89 and 90 or 95, 96, they have some very different characters to it. So um, I think before we talk about it, um, let's all smell and taste the 2009 and just take a second with it because um, you'll see we're really monstrously stepping up in quality here. Uh, and I saw Emery's face there. Um, the size of the nose on this and the size of the palate, this is a monstrous wine. So let's just take a second with it.
it's kind of like a meal uh, all in itself. You don't need dinner uh, when you've got 2009 Le Mission Aubryon. Uh, clearly, what a massive wine. Um, you can see why Robert Parker originally said that this was a wine which was going to last for somewhere between 50 and 75 plus years. Um, this is really one of the great, great vintages of Bordeaux, especially on the left bank. Uh, and for Lemission, this was 100 points from Robert Parker. Um, I think 100 points recently again from Lisa Perotti brown um, at The Wine Advocate. Um, just a monster and a really interesting makeup of this wine as well. Um, it's equal parts Cabernet and Merlot. It's 47% of each exactly. Um, so with just that, that little bit of Cabernet Franc in there. Um, a little bit unusual having the Cabernet and the Merlot both um, in equal parts because they, even in great vintages, generally one outperforms the other, but not in this year in 2009. The quality was so uniform um, between all the grapes. Now, um, you can probably guess that the alcohol is pretty high in this. I think it says topping 15% in that tasting note, uh, but the technical notes I've got from the estate here was, was coming in at 14.7 uh, was the kind of exact there. Um, a pretty high alcohol vintage, um, very, very warm um, across all of Europe. Um, I wouldn't call it a heat wave, but it was a very, very warm year. Um, perfectly ripe fruit um, coming in. They hadn't seen fruit um, coming in like this for a very, very long time. The, the 2009s are, they're ripe, they're rich, they're opulent, um, they're sexy, you know, all that style of the fruit is there. Um, but they're also structured uh, and they're firm and they're age worthy. Um, there's still plenty of acid there. There's still masses of tannin there. Um, they're pretty special wines. Um, you can see how these wines were, you know, just hugely lauded when they came out. And the price of the 2009s uh, was monstrous, as monstrous as the wines really, um, especially in the United States. This was a very, very popular vintage for the US, despite it being the most expensive vintage, I think, of all time um, when they did come out. Um, just incredible weather conditions. Um, they were loving it in Bordeaux when it first came out, and they thought that they weren't going to see another vintage um, like this for maybe another decade at least, um, until 2010 came along, uh, which was only the year after. Um, so I think these are two wines, especially nine and 10, that a lot of people talk about and compare. So we need to talk about them and compare them as well. So um, before we get too deep into them, let's look at the 2010 as well now, and you'll see the style is very, very different, uh, but man, the 2010 is good. So let's try that. Regan, I think when you taste that 2010, you can um, imagine my reference before to how delicious the 11s were tasting on Premier after, you know, five days of that kind of wine in a row. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the tannins are so dense uh, and so dark um, in the 20s, and there's so much of them. Yes, they're fine. They're very, very fine tannins on all the top 2010s, but the qu sheer quantity of them like overwhelms your mouth. I mean, you can see again why this is a wine that, I mean, you could still be drinking this in 50 years time, like absolutely no question. Um, Liz, were the 2010s um, mainly Cab Sav dominant in, through, right across Bordeaux? Yeah, 2010 um, is a really good year for Cabernet. Um, it's a, I don't want to <laughs> steal what Regan's about to talk about, um, but it's a year that, um, you get huge purity of fruit. You know, it's nines are a lot warmer in terms of character and you can see it in these two wines and the acidity is a lot um, more pronounced in that 2010, which for me, I think cuts through and sort of gives the, the generosity of fruit, the lift that it needs. You know, sometimes when you get that really ripe, intense Cabernet, if you don't get the acidity right beside it, you just end up with jam. And, you know, I'm sure you can think of um, enough wines in the world where Cabernet has been growing in a really hot condition 
and there's not been enough acidity in what they taste like. This is that great ripeness, but it's got the acidity there, and it just then gives the purity to the fruit. Ten, I love the tens. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> yeah. I won't <laughs> won't hide that. Yeah, I have to say I'm I'm biased towards the tens as well. I've I've always pre um, preferred probably the tens to the nines, um, but that's not to say that I don't also love the nines. It's more just a case of if I had to choose between one or the other, I would generally choose a 10 because I, I just love the precision um, and the focus that the 10s have. Um, they still have all the weight and the muscle that the nines have, uh, but perhaps a little bit less exotic, a little bit less classic. It, but I certainly wouldn't argue with somebody who liked one over the other. Um, though I've got a, an interesting comment here from, um, uh, from a winemaker when he was looking at the, um, uh, at the two between them. Um, it was the technical director, Jean René of uh, uh, Pichon Lalonde in Pouillac, and he said, um, uh, even though I love the personality of the 2009s, the 2010s have more vigor, um, more, uh, more fresh aromas with the fruit more well-preserved uh, by the tannins. And he describes them as um, 2009, 2010, you've got a choice between uh, a Lamborghini uh, and an Aston Martin. So one's uh, a lot of show, a lot of noise and one's a little bit more classic and restrained um, but it just depends on the personality and what you're looking for kind of at the time because they're they're both very very good certainly when they were young um, the 2009s as Liz said um, probably also an entrepreneur um, much much easier to drink um, you know that opulence and that fruit richness and that softness of the tannins even though there's massive tannins there just made them a little bit more approachable in the young. The 2010s are, were very, very challenging, um, especially initially when they came out. You could see the quality there, uh, but they weren't necessarily that enjoyable. Um, you could see how good they were going to be, but you had to kind of see it intellectually rather than sensory. Uh, whereas the 2009s, I mean, they just impressed um, right, right from the start, I think. Um, so I had um, uh, another guy who said that uh, if you were looking at um, the two different vintages as far as, um, as winemakers said, um, he said that most winemakers in Bordeaux preferred the 2010s um, over the 2009. So it really kind of depends. Um, if you look at a lot of the American wine tasters, they say that they prefer the 2009s, more layers of fruit, um, more flesh, uh, you know, much tastier, the 2010s, a little bit too austere, um, going to require um, a much longer time period. Um, I think in America, they sold 10 times as much 2009 uh, as they did 2010. Um, so really, really different. Um, yet, you know, like Sir Pichon Lalonde, he said uh, that 100% of us winemakers prefer 2010 over 2009. Now, now I'm sure it's not, a, not actually 100%, but I think in Bordeaux, um, a lot of them did prefer the, the 2010s. So it really depends what you like. Um, the makeup of these two wines um, is significantly different though. I mean, we had half Cabernet, half Merlot um, in that 2009, whereas we're looking at, um, at over 60% Cabernet in this 2010. It's 62% Cabernet, 37% Merlot, and, and it's literally 1% Cabernet Franc in there. Um, and I don't know whether you would say this from tasting it, but it's a higher alcohol in this 2010 than it is in the 2009. Uh, you're 14.7 in the 2009 um, actual, and you're 15.1 in the 2010 actual. Now, unfortunately, I can't tell you what it actually says on the label because I don't have the bottles in front of me there, but those are the actual technical um, alcohols from the winery. Um, man, it's hard to pick between those two wines, though. I mean, I, I just love that, that size and that richness in the palate of the 2009. But... I think really, really long term, if I was going to be drinking these wines when they were 50 plus, I would, I would go for the 2010 for myself. But I certainly wouldn't argue with anybody who, who prefers the 2009. I mean, it's absolutely just a style question there. I think they're, they're, it's clear to see why both of them are 100 point wines. Mm -hmm. I think also, Regan, it depends on your frame of reference. Mm. Um, and, you know, the Bordelais do tend to like the 10s, but the 10s are, they're classic. Um, and they've got that freshness and that austerity to them um, with all of those other good things that the nine have. 
Whereas I think the nines, if your frame of reference is perhaps the new world, um, then the nines are going to be very appealing. And I think that's what, you know, I remember when the nines first arrived for us in New Zealand, you know, we had huge success with them because if you don't drink a lot of Bordeaux, the 2009s are a really good place to start. Um, whereas if you like classic Bordeaux that's going to age beautifully, the 10s are a really good place to be. Yeah, agreed. And I think that's why it's interesting to have 2015 in this lineup as well, because 2015, obviously, and 2016, um, another two amazing pair of vintages together. Again, very, very different in style. Uh, and again, in exactly the same, it seems to happen this way in Bordeaux, um, almost exactly the same as 9 and 10 or 89 and 90. The first of the pair of vintages always seems to be the fleshier, riper, more opulent, more exotic one. Um, 89, 2009, 2015. And then the second one in the pair always seems to be a little bit more acid, a little bit more tannin, a little bit darker fruit, a little bit more classic, uh, a little bit more freshness maybe, which is 90, um, 2010 uh, and 2016. So it seems to be the way that it's gone there. So we've got 2015 uh, here in our glass next. And I think one of the things that we've also seen as we've moved through here is not only difference in vintages, uh, but also um, quality of winemaking um, across Bordeaux has never been better. And that's certainly the same at, at Le Mission O'Brien here. Um, let's have a look at the 2015 vintage, which this is another like, you know, monstrously successful vintage, another huge favorite of mine. So let's taste this and then we'll have a little talk about it. Mm. Well, and you can see straight away on the nose of that 2015, it doesn't smell like either the nine or the 10. Mm -hmm. Huge lift, huge aromatics. You can see this massive density there, but it's very fresh. It's almost a little bit like that 2011, but monstrously supercharged. I think also because of its youth, this is probably the first time we've seen the oak quite pronounced. Wow, that is a beautiful wine. And you can see that's the only wine here that's really still showing nothing but primary fruit characteristics. There's nothing secondary coming through. Um, interesting to see that there's no hint of that 2009 or that 2010 actually closing down though, Liz, at the moment. I thought that one of them might have been in a bit of a hole, not really showing much, but both of them were really quite open tonight, I thought. Um, 2015 though, I mean, that's, that's still a very, very young wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have enough experience tasting La Mission over the years to know whether it's one that goes into a hole. Um, you know, it's such a big wine. I don't know. Um, I mean, they've got a bit of age on them already, but they're also, you know, like that previous um, three where they just weren't showing the age they actually are. You know, if you had those, that nine and ten blind, you wouldn't have been thinking they were the ages that they are. No, no, not at all. <laughs> Um, yeah. Now, I mean, 2015, I mean, this is another just fabulous vintage um, across um, uh, both sides of Bordeaux. I mean, the wines are rich. Um, they're still extremely young, but they've got this drama to them, this um, excitement that I think that marks this as a more modern vintage, even than 9 and 10. You had masses of sunshine, but you still had really, really cool nights. Um, especially with the Cabernet, it meant that you got um, very, very thick skins on the Cabernet. Um, so intensely concentrated flavors, um, big, bold tannins to them as well. Um, looking at the style of it, even as the vintage was going through, um, most people, I think Stephen Spurrier said, he said, this is a very modern Bordeaux vintage. It's not even like Bordeaux 10 years ago where the tannins could be very hard said in 2015 that the fruit just dominates the tannins and the acidity, but the tannins and the acidity support that fruit in perfect balance. Um, and a lot of estates on the left bank here, um, 
they were saying as the vintage progressed, it was clear it was going to be a great, great vintage um, because they just didn't have any bad weather, but it kept changing the style it might be like kind of towards the end of July, they were thinking it was going to be more like 2005. And then it became more like 2009. Um, and then like in the last kind of weeks of the harvest, it was looking more like 2010. Um, but it ended up utterly unique and like none of them. I mean, it's got much more fresh fruit in the 2015s than the 2009. And it doesn't have as much kind of structure and as much power um, as the 2010s. So it sits kind of somewhere between nine and 10 in style, you know, not as concentrated as 2009, but not as kind of austere and hard and structured as 2010. So, I mean, it is beautiful, beautiful wine. So I, I really like the 15s though. Again, I am a bit of a sucker for that, that classicism, um, acidity. I love acidity in top wines. I love freshness. Um, if that freshness and acidity and that, elegance can come along with size then that's kind of my perfection um, which is why i have a, again a slight preference for 2016 over 2015 um, but again that would only be if you're keeping the wines for the long term um, 2016 like 2010 is going to require decades of aging whereas if you're going to be drinking in that medium term um, definitely 2009 or 2015 um, which i can't think is what we're seeing in this wine here i mean I would be more than happy to drink that 2015 tonight for dinner with a decant. I think it's showing exceptionally well. Mm. I think also what we're seeing in 15, Regan, it's quite interesting, is 15 and then more pronounced once you move to the 16 and 17s. We're seeing less impact um, on Bordeaux as a region um, from Robert Parker's influence. And, yeah, absolutely. you know, if you compare the nine and the 15 tonight, that is a brilliant example of the kind of style of wines the region was making to, you know, to satisfy a style that was perceived as where they needed to be. And I think that's why, you know, 15, characteristically, there's a lot of conditions in both vintages that were the same. And we could have ended up with wines that tasted very similar to nine. But we had a sort of different mindset coming because we weren't seeing Parker there tasting as much. And certainly that stopped from 16 and 17. Uh, and the region, you know, they're not talking about it a lot, but there's starting to be a little bit more chatter that this is a return to classic Bordeaux. And this is less about a reliance on the critics and more a let's make the best wines we can. And gosh, isn't it wonderful to see it? Yeah, that's a great point, Liz, I think especially looking at nine and 15 together, which this is why this is such a great opportunity because you're right. I mean, those would probably be the two modern vintages that you would say style wise are closest together, yeah. but look how different they are, you know? Um, and, and we're not looking that far apart, you know, we're only looking six years later, um, but suddenly Parker's not tasting it on premier anymore. And they've got some different ideas as a new guard coming in, um, new wine drinkers, a younger wine drinker coming in and they're, most of them are looking for things that are a little bit fresher, a little bit more vibrant um, and a little bit more balanced, a little bit less alcohol perhaps as well. Um, though not that that's the case in this wine, this is 15.1%. Um, but again, it holds it so well. You, you couldn't tell that this was 15.1. I mean, this is, this is the, well, it might even be 15.2, um, but it's certainly the equal highest out of these three. Um, other interesting thing with this is less Cabernet. In fact, this is a Merlot dominant wine. Mm. Um, the only one out of the three. Uh, I think, yeah, we're almost 60% Merlot. So, I mean, we were 62% Cabernet um, in that 2010. Um, so very, very different. 35% um, Cab Sab, 7% Cabernet Franc. Um, and this year they actually went, um, you, said, you mentioned the Oplers. Um, there's a lot of new oak in this, I think 78%. Um, so they did bump it up quite a bit in this but they balanced that by bringing the cabernet down so that the wine wasn't too austere um so i mean it's yeah. definitely like he says one of the great modern day classics mm -hmm. and if you think back to when the dylan family took over it and you know they went through and, and replanted some of the vineyard some of the parts of the vineyard and increased the amount of merlot and with an average vine age of 25 years um this is probably from where we you know this is probably a yeah. quite yeah. a uh, fundamental turning point for 
what they're looking to do and you know if that's a signal of where the future is um it's a good one mm, absolutely i mean i think a lot of people um also are looking for what's the difference between Le Mission and Oberon, because I, I actually think that perhaps more people have tasted Oberon than they have Le Mission um, because of that um, weird kind of gray area where it sits in where people are like, oh, well, you know, it's too expensive for a second growth, but if I'm going to spend that much, I'll buy a first growth. But it's just so different. Um, stylistically, if you're looking at it, I would, you can see from this tasting, and if you've had a lot of Oberon before, that Oberon is the, the more restrained, the more elegant of the two. It's a little bit smokier. The tannins are a little bit finer. Uh, it's got more of that kind of maybe limestone and iodine character coming through. Um, Le Mission is definitely muscular. It's, it's definitely much more brawnier. It's got more tannin. It's a little bit darker. Um, Oberon always starts out quite restrained. Um, and as it ages, it develops that complexity and that richness and that kind of smoky notes that we see in the grabs there. Um, whereas Le Mission, um, you know, often is exuberant right from the start. Um, it's got all of these mellow tannins. Um, it's got all of this richness to it. It's a big, bold wine. You know, it's very, very impressive right at the start. And I certainly think when you put Le Mission up against uh, a lot of the other second growths, you can see why it sits in between and why it would be the kind of the prime contender uh, for upgrading to first growth if we ever did that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, very good. Excellent. Well, um, I think, Regan, unfortunately, that brings us to the end of a tasting. It does. I, think, I, I wish um, we had the 16 as well now. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting in the mood to drink Le Mission au Brion. <laughs> yeah. I think just in um, putting together this tasting, you know, we started, I think you started very well, Regan, by pointing out that, you know, this is not a property that we open very often no. because it just sits in the middle of everywhere. Um, it's not a first growth, but it packs well above the weight of a second growth. And it just sort of sits out there on its own. And I love Jancis's uh, quote that, you know, it's the, the insider's best find or however she put it. But, you know, this is the wine that if you know, you know. Uh, and I think the opportunity to look at it tonight, but also look at a set of weaker vintages, and a set of good vintages has been great to get to know what La Mission Hortbriand's about. Um, hopefully, I think what we've also showed tonight is don't ever dismiss the four vintages. Just in the four vintages, make sure that you're buying properties that did do very well in those vintages. And I guess rest assured with Glengarry's selection that we, I mean, we taste rigorously anyway, um, but it's actually in a way, when I'm tasting something like the 2010 on Premier, it's academic because the wines are all good. When I'm tasting something like 11 um, and definitely 13, you know, that's when it actually, it's hard work, but it's necessary to find the, the wines that stand out. And when you get those great wines from the lesser vintages, as we've seen tonight, they're wines that, hey, all of us are going to be able to enjoy in our lifetime. Um, and, you know, when you look at some of the ageing recommendations on um, the 9 and 10, um, I think even I'm too old. So hopefully we've, we've shown you all of those things tonight. And it's certainly, uh, I love the fact that I talked about the lesser vintages, as you can probably tell. Uh, and um, great pleasure to be able to talk about these wines tonight. So thank you all very, very much for um, joining us online. And I'll, I'll let Regan have the final word, but I just did want to point out, if you have not booked already, we have a Taylor's Port tasting next week. We've got, um, uh, is it three or four vintages of vintage Port there's, Regan? There's three 100 point vintage wines. I think it's 1994, 2016 and 2007 off the top of my head. Yeah. Three, so three pack of hundreds. Mm. And yeah, I, so, I, I tried a couple of them this afternoon and yes, they are very, very good. <laughs> so that's going to be presented uh, all the way from Portugal. So very exciting. Um, we've also uh, got a Charles Heidsick tasting coming up in November. So that's up online now. And it has four vintages of Charles, including the eight and the 12 
uh, which are two of the greatest vintages from Tales Heidsick ever. Um, there's also some incredible wines outside that, but that's that's what I'm really looking forward to. And we have a dinner coming up, which is uh, at Paris Butter, and it's up on Jervois Road, and that um, is with Opus One. And if you are sitting there thinking American wine at the top end is not for me, uh, you need to try Opus One. Um, and there's a, a good collection of it there. So yeah, thank you very, very much for joining us. Regan. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Lizzie. I think I, the way I view Opus One is it's uh, basically a nice cheap way of drinking Mouton Rothschild um, because <laughs> it's about half the price of Mouton and flavor profile wise, it's very, very similar. Um, so we're going to be tasting the Overture from Opus One, which is their multi-vintage blend. Um, and with the entree, um, I think there'll be some champagne to start and then we'll have two vintages of Opus um, with the main. Um, there might be a secret vintage come out later on and we've got some tawny port as well. So it's going to be pretty cool. Um, if you're not already coming, I think there's still maybe five or six places left for the first growth tasting next Wednesday as well. We were trying all the 2017 first growths, including um, Chateau Petrus. I know there's some people here tonight who uh, will be joining us next uh, Wednesday. So I'm very, very excited about that. Um, it's always an exciting night when you try Petrus. Um, but certainly one of the things that really stood out for me tonight, like you said, Liz, about those lesser vintages also, is one of the things I love about Bordeaux is the price in those vintages, um, less than half of the price of the nine, the 10, and the 15. So it is always nice to see that in Bordeaux that yes, yeah, they, they make their money when it's a great vintage, that's for sure. Uh, and nine and 10 were the two most expensive vintages in history. Um, you can see it still hasn't been surpassed. 15 and 16, um, superlatively good, um, but they still haven't reached the heights of those, um, of the, the, the nine and the 10. Whereas that Lemission though, at 1400 at full retail, I mean, that's still $500 less than Aubryon was at the on premier price. I think on, pre, on premier Aubryon was 2,200. Um, so it was about three grand on the shelf. Um, so you can see it's, uh, it's, it's interesting in Bordeaux how it goes up and down, um, but it means that those lighter vintages or the vintages that are less um, sought after, not only can you drink them earlier, but you also don't have to pay so much for them, which is nice. Um, so thank you guys very much for joining us tonight. We'll send out an email tomorrow uh, with an offer on these wines and there'll also be a link um, to the tasting on YouTube as well if you wanted to um, re-watch anything. Um, but thank you for joining us. I know that this one got um, postponed a couple of times thanks to COVID um, and it ended up being a virtual tasting, um, but um, very, very good to present these to you guys and certainly um, a lineup of wines I've been wanting to try side by side for a really, really long time. Um, so thank you guys for supporting us and joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, everyone.